Thank you for your patience. Uh, okay. My name is Eric Gerbaum, and uh, along with Art Mansfield, I welcome you to the Political Theory Colloquium for the Program of Constitutional Government. And it's just my pleasure to introduce Diana Shao, Professor of Political Science at Loyola Marymount University, Loyola University, Maryland. Excuse me, uh, I spent some time at Marymount a while ago. Um, and she's also a member of the Hoover Institution's uh, Jill and Boyd Smith Task Force on the Virtues of Free Society. I noticed the timing of her postdoc here at this program of constitutional government not so long ago uh, immediately preceded her first book, Erotic Liberalism, Women and Revolution, and Montesquieu's Persian Letters. So uh, that book, uh, I guess the final was a productive it, year. Yeah, it was a very productive year, right. Um, number of book chapters and articles, and she's also the co-editor of what so proudly we hail the American soul in story, speech, and song. Um, and I just couldn't imagine a more relevant paper to today, a new speaker in the house uh, who will undoubtedly go back to Montesquieu <laughs> um, and spend his time uh, with, like, with, like all uh, uh, politicians must, um, but uh, to hear her talk about principles uh, and practice in Montesquieu today. And Roy will respond, okay. um, and then we'll go to Q&A. So, well, Thanks. Thanks. Right. Uh, yes, The Spirit of the Laws uh, is a book for legislators. It was designed to be a book for legislators. Uh, the architects of the American Constitution were aware of that. They steeped themselves in it. Uh, Montesquieu is the most quoted authority in the Federalist Papers. He's appealed to by both Hamilton uh, and Madison. There are 11 distinct quotations from him. And at one point, he is said to be the oracle who is always consulted and cited. Uh, Oracle seems to me the right word because Montesquieu is wise, but like the Delphic priestess, he is also cryptic. So difficult is he to decipher that he was routinely appealed to by both sides in the ratification debates. In fact, there was a kind of contest that went on between Federalists and Anti-Federalists uh, to lay claim to the celebrated Montesquieu. Madison sets forth the task of every Montesquieu reader when he declares, let us endeavor in the first place to ascertain his meaning. Madison was interested in ascertaining Montesquieu's meaning on a particular point, the doctrine of the separation of powers. Um, I want to attempt something more general, uh, namely to consider Montesquieu as uh, an author of maxims, as a maximizer. Uh, commentary on Montesquieu often emphasizes his anti-universalism, uh, his relativism, uh, his attention to the unique features of political life uh, in different times and different places. Uh, I certainly don't disagree with the claims that are made about Montesquieu's flexibility, uh, his invitation to prudence, but I think it's interesting that the American founders, who were in a position to be lawgivers in a comprehensive sense, always discuss Montesquieu with reference to principles, doctrines, and maxims. They assigned priority to Montesquieu principles, while at the same time they allowed their own considerable prudence uh, to operate under the guidance of those principles. So I guess I'm sort of making an argument for Montesquieu uh, for the possibility of a, of a flexible and sophisticated universalism. Now, in the preface, uh, Montesquieu tells his readers that if they desire to search out the design of the author, they have to do so by uncovering the design of the work. Neither design, neither the authorial intention nor the structure, uh, is altogether obvious or clear. But it is very encouraging to be told by the author himself that what is accessible from the surface, namely the layout of the work, there are 31 books uh, divided into six parts, that that structure discloses a path to his deeper purpose. Uh, further, Montesquieu informs us that the way he found to navigate the infinite diversity of laws and mores is by principles and principles that are rooted in the nature of things. So that indicates the priority of principle for Montesquieu, but the statement is also baffling because over the long course of the book, Montesquieu uses principle in two very different senses. Uh, sometimes he means by principle a general law or a rule that serves as a guide to conduct, and so he refers to things like the principles of war, the principles of economics, the principles of the civil law, the principles of religion, and constitutional principles. Other times, however, Montesquieu uses this word principle to refer not to a consciously adopted maxim, but instead to an underlying source of action. So he, it, this is a very unusual use of the word principle. Uh, he uses the word principle to describe certain motivating passions that animate the various forms of government. So he says that republics are characterized by the principle, which is to say the passion of virtue, uh, monarchy is characterized by the principle of honor, which is to say the passion of honor. 
Uh, and despotism is characterized by the principle of fear, which is to say the passion of fear. So these are regime-specific passions which serve as the principle of the regime. It's a kind of effective cause. So principle understood as passion governs from below or internally, whereas principle understood as law or maxim governs from above or externally. And intriguingly, the movement of the work as a whole seems to be from the former sense, the passionate sense, to the, to the, to the lawful sense. Uh, and in fact, after part one, where he lays out that famous tripartite uh, you know, schema of regimes, Montesquieu makes very little mention of the regime principles. Uh, understood as motivating passions. Instead, this more doctrinal sense of principle becomes more pronounced. And the book that is most about principles in the sense of rules is book 26. Uh, remember, there are 31 altogether, so it's quite late. Uh, and that book closes out part five. The stated purpose of book 26 is to delineate, quote, the principles that should govern men. So what I want to do is offer a kind of commentary on that book. Uh, but before doing that, uh, especially for those of you who may not be uh, closely familiar with the, with the structure of the whole, I want to kind of take you through the, uh, the six-part argument, uh, at least my reading of that six-part argument. Uh, if we take Montesquieu's advice from the preface, which is to pay attention to the work's design, then the situation of Book 26, the place that it uh, occupies and the architecture of the argument, will help to reveal its meaning. All right, so book one, uh, I'm sorry, part one, books one through eight. That lays out the typology of governments. Uh, there are three regimes, republics, monarchies, despotisms. Uh, Montesquieu sort of dissects all three regimes, talks both about the nature and the principle, and those are different things uh, of each of those regimes. And I think what he does in this opening section is to actually reveal the despotic tendencies within even the non-despotic regimes. Uh, so he actually shows the way in which the republic, by which he means the ancient republics, the city-states, um, are unsustainable uh, as a result of the internal weakness of these various passionate springs. Uh, and so the final book of this section, book eight, is entitled On the Corruption of the Principles of the Three Governments. Uh, so he, he needs to look for a regime which is more able to resist that natural tendency towards uh, corruption and dissolution. Uh, and in part two, uh, he, he undertakes that search. He reveals a new standard, the standard of liberty, and a regime that's uh, explicitly devoted to liberty, namely England. Uh, it's a regime that we might call a modern commercial republic. In other words, not, not, the, uh, not the ancient city-states. Uh, this new sort of republic differs from the ancient variety in being based on liberty rather than virtue, commerce rather than martial courage, and the pursuit of self-interest rather than the rigors of self-denial. Uh, it might be worth mentioning that the way in which Montesquieu defines virtue in the ancient republic, it is a renunciation of self uh, and a preference for the, for the collective. So you could see its operation in, say, the Spartan mother with her five sons, all of whom die in a single battle on the same day, and the messenger comes to tell her of the loss of her five sons, and she says, don't speak to me of my sons. Did, did Sparta win the battle? Uh, the, another way in which Montesquieu illustrates this principle of virtue is to describe monks. Uh, for whom every natural outlet of the passions is closed off, and that makes them love the order that, in, that afflicts them. Right? All of their passions are channeled into that love of, uh, of, the, of the order. So, uh, so England is very different from, uh, from those monkish uh, ancient regimes. Uh, England doesn't fit within Montesquieu's original typology. Uh, especially since English liberty does not depend on a principle in the sense of a specific passion. Uh, and I think Montesquieu is pretty explicit about this. He says that in England, all the passions are let loose, including passions like hatred, envy, jealousy, and greed. In this riot of the passions, and Montesquieu at one point calls it the frenzy of liberty, what prevents England from descending into utter chaos? According to Montesquieu, successful liberty turns out to depend on the principles of their constitution, 
especially the separation or distribution of powers, the subject uh, about which Madison called Montesquieu the oracle. Now, in the, in the later consideration of England, the first consideration of England comes in uh, Book 11. Uh, there's a later extensive consideration of England in Book 19. Uh, in that later consideration, Montesquieu does express some reservations about the English character. Uh, nonetheless, I think that Montesquieu is favorably disposed towards this new form of government uh, in which institutional arrangements work to channel that free flow of the passions. But he also raises some serious doubts about the universalizability of that regime of liberty. Right? You know, is that English model simply exportable uh, around the world? Uh, you know, can you have an Arab Spring? Uh, so because of Montesquieu's doubts, about the exportability of the regime of liberty, the spirit of the laws do not, does not end with books 11 and 12 on constitutional principles. I mean, often when Montesquieu is taught, uh, I suspect this may have been the case with some of you, that's what you read. Uh, you read the, the, the stuff on the separation of powers. Uh, but a lot happens in the book uh, after, uh, after those books 11 and 12. And in fact, in part three, uh, which is books 14 through 19, Montesquieu seems to turn away from the analysis of political liberty. And instead, he inquires into despotism, and especially the despotism of nature itself. So it isn't only or even primarily human beings who rule despotically. Montes in, uh, here, uh, you know, Montesquieu uh, has his explor explorations of climate and terrain. Uh, he sometimes takes some heat today on some of the things that he says there about. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but you know, so so he looks at the way in which climate and terrain shape human character and laws. He says, in some unfortunate places, uh, you know, domestic, civil, and political slavery are virtually mandated by the climate. So Montesquieu tempers our liberal universalism by investigating the natural obstacles to its realization. As he grimly notes, even liberty has appeared intolerable to peoples who were not accustomed to enjoying it. But Montesquieu does not give up hope. Uh, and at the end of part three, there's a, a really wonderful book uh, devoted to what Montesquieu calls the general spirit of a nation. It occupies a very crucial position within the design of the whole. It serves as a bridge between the section on nature in part three and then the final three parts of the, of the work, the second half of the work. Uh, in book 19, Montesquieu shows how this general spirit of each nation, which is the end result of a variety of factors, can itself become a means whereby a philosophic legislator introduces new habits, new mores, new practices. Uh, the key chapter, I think, in book 19 is chapter 14, what are the natural means of changing the mores and manners of a nation? It's the title of that chapter 14. So the general spirit turns out to be key to this successful movement from despotism to liberty. Uh, it serves as a kind of legislative compass. It makes possible the navigation of the political universe. Accordingly, Book 19 presents itself as more frankly devoted to the teaching of legislators than any earlier book. Those who want to, uh, who aspire to give laws, have to understand the character of the people for whom they are legislating. That character sets the boundaries of reform, and it constitutes the material of reform. So then you've got the second half of the Spirit of the Laws, uh, Part Four, uh, books 20 to 23, which deal with commerce, which is a kind of sub-political element. Part five, uh, books 24 to 26 on religion, which is kind of supra-political element. Uh, and then part six, uh, books 27 to 31 uh, on the evolution of the French state. And this is the part that almost nobody reads anymore <laughs> because it's incredibly detailed stuff about French inheritance law and the evolution of the, of the French monarchy. Uh, but I think what Montesquieu is doing in all of those parts, parts four, four, five, and six, he's examining various possibilities of national metamorphosis uh, and the various avenues by which that metamorphosis could occur. Uh, and he gives sort of little clues to the centrality of metamorphosis uh, by the epigraphs that he chooses. There's both an epigraph to the work as a whole and an epigraph to Book 28, which is especially about the evolution of the French laws. Uh, and both of those epigraphs are from Ovid's Metamorphosis. The second one reads, my imagination brings me to speak of forms changing into new bodies. 
So that's my sketch of the essential lines of Montesquieu's undertaking. We can turn to Book 26 to see the new shape that political life will assume under the aegis of the principles that he there articulates. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to remember another piece of interpretive advice that Montesquieu uh, offered in the preface. There he said, the more one reflects on the details, the more one will feel the certainty of the principles. So it's imperative in reading Montesquieu to delve into the often bizarre examples, and they are genuinely bizarre often. <laughs> they are weird. You don't know why he's talking about the things that he's talking about. Uh, he's got footnotes. Uh, the footnotes are to these antique codes of law. Uh, there are classical allusions, and then you have his own kind of iterations, reiterations, redefinitions, uh, shifting definitions, so it's, it's kind of origami-like, fold upon fold. So I think to find Montesquieu, you have to first sort of get lost in him and give, give yourself up to those, to those details. Uh, which makes it actually very hard to sort of present this in talk form because it's probably boring when it's been delivered. <laughs> <laughs> Verbally. Uh, all right, so book 26 has, a, has an awkward title. On the laws in the relation they should have with the order of things upon which they are to enact. <laughs> Montesquieu seemed to be aware that readers might be perplexed by that title, and he comes to our assistance right away with the, uh, with the first chapter title of book 26, and that chapter title is The Idea of This Book. The basic point seems to be that there are different orders or types of laws, and there should be a correspondence between the orders of laws and the orders of things. It sounds sensible, uh, but what does Montesquieu mean by the order of things? Back in the preface, you have to keep going back and forth because he uses, he echoes the language in different places. Uh, back in the preface, Montesquieu made the striking assertion that he drew his principles from the nature of things. Now, book 26 reveals that the nature of things is ordered, and each separate order of things has its own ruling principles that in turn give shape to the various types of law, so that, for instance, Montesquieu can say, things ruled by the principles of civil right must not be ruled by the principles of what is called canonical right. Interestingly, the other place where Montesquieu <coughs> refers to an order of things is in the first chapter of that very important book, 19. There are all kinds of links between and echoes between 19 and 26. Uh, remember, 19 is the book on the general spirit. That first chapter, too, has a uniquely explanatory title. It's the subject of this book. So Montesquieu doesn't actually say what the subject is, but he says that, uh, maybe I'll just, I'll just read it. Uh, it's very short. Most of these chapters are just a, a few sentences. On the subject of this book, this material is very extensive. In this crowd of ideas that present themselves in my spirit, I shall be more attentive to the order of things than to the things themselves. I must push things away, break through, and bring my subject to light. So if you put together these two oddly didactic uh, chapters, one entitled The Subject of the Book, the other entitled The Idea of This Book, we might say that the subject of the book is the natural order of things, the idea of this book is how to assign those things to the right legal order. Presumably, in each of these cases, the reference to this book in the chapter title has a double meaning. It describes both the specific book, either book 19 or book 26, but it also, I think, refers to the spirit of the laws as a whole. Uh, and there's actually another chapter title that sort of fits into this same pattern. Uh, it's in Book 11, the one that deals with the English Constitution. If you have your Montesquieu with you, it's page 186. Uh, chapter 20, end of this book. End as in purpose or aim. I should like to seek out in all the moderate governments we know the distribution of the three powers and calculate thereupon the degrees of liberty each one of them can enjoy. But one must not always so exhaust a subject that one leaves nothing for the reader to do. It's not a question of making him read, but of making him think. So it's up to us to act as legislators who figure out what, what the Constitution of Liberty will look like in different places. Uh, all right, so back with our topic of how do we make these proper assignments. Uh, according to Montesquieu, this is a job for the sublimity of human reason. 
Uh, Montesquieu begins Book 26 by listing nine different types of law. Each of those forms of law is based on its own form of right, natural right, divine right, civil right, political right. Uh, the list is just a start. The difficult part is to know what things, what human activities, what associations, what crimes uh, belong in each category and what you do in cases of conflict or overlapping jurisdictions. Montesquieu is very emphatic about the results of failure. What we want to avoid, he says, is putting confusion into the principles that should govern men. Now, not surprising, given the echoes and links that we've already seen between books 19 and 26, this passage about putting confusion into the principles sends us back to book 19. Book 19 is the only book after those in part one, right, where principle meant motivating passion, to actually have the word principle in the title. Furthermore, it contains a chapter, 1914, entitled, How Some Legislators Have Confused the Principles That Govern Men. So we're going to see what it looks like, what failure looks like. Montesquieu's primary example of confusion is the legislators of China, although he also mentions Lycurgus, the lawgiver of Sparta, and in a daring footnote, he mentions both Moses and the Romans. So there you have it. The Greeks, the Romans, the <laughs> Jews, and the Eastern dynasties all got it wrong. In every case, the error was to make law unitary and totalizing. Montesquieu says, Lycurgus made a single code for the laws, the mores, and the manners. The legislators of China did more. They confused religion, laws, mores, and manners. All was morality. All was virtue. Similarly, Moses made a single code of laws and religion. Uh, Montesquieu does not here mention the two great offshoots of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, but one has to wonder whether they're guilty of that same confusion of principles, uniting things that ought to be kept separate. Uh, and the whole of part five, remember book 26 is the concluding book in part five. The two previous books uh, dealt uh, extensively with religion uh, and uh, especially with both Christianity and Islam. Uh, Montesquieu delivers a kind of civic assessment of religious doctrines and practices, and he hints at the moderating changes that would need to be made in these established religions for them to be harmonized with a sound political order. Right. Uh, so he talks not only about a kind of taming of, of Christianity, but also the need for a taming of, uh, of Islam. So uh, Montesquieu is actually a good resource today in thinking about the, uh, the direction of Islam. Uh, Montesquieu proceeds in an interesting way. He doesn't confront belief directly uh, in the way someone like Hobbes does. Uh, he pursues a much more uh, insinuating and sort of insidious strategy. Uh, he uh, aims to create tangible, this-worldly satisfactions that will displace those dangerous uh, hopes in things unseen. Uh, the reason those hopes in things unseen are dangerous is because, Montesquieu says, men who believe in the certainty of rewards, heavenly rewards, uh, will escape the legislator. They will have too much scorn for death. Uh, so by the start of Book 26, uh, attentive readers of the Spirit of the Laws will be alert to Montesquieu's intention to reconfigure religion. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise that the first thing he does is to declare the sublimity of human reason. Divine law is subordinated to human law. It's placed under the disposition of the human legislator. It falls to the sublimity of human reason to regulate what Montesquieu earlier referred to as the more sublime truths of religion. Uh, and the sampling of the chapter titles uh, really uh, indicates the, the general direction. Uh, let's read a few of them. That one must not decide by the precepts of religion when those of natural law are in question that things ruled by the principles of civil right must not be ruled by the principles of what is called canonical right, that things that should be ruled by the principles of civil right can rarely be ruled by the principles of the laws of religion, in what case one must follow the civil law that permits and not the religious law that forbids, that human tribunals must not be ruled by the maxims of the tribunals that regard the next life. Almost every one of the 25 chapter headings in Book 26 do this kind of uh, uh, assigning of boundaries. 
right? distinguishing boundaries, granting precedence to some forms of law over others. Uh, and it seems to me if Montesquieu's guidelines are followed, the scope of religious authority will be severely constricted. Uh, the constriction begins in chapter two with what looks like an argument for separate spheres, right? easily divided separate spheres. Uh, Montesquieu says that you know, the essential principle of divine and human laws are, 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 are different. Uh, divine law is the unchanging enactment of the best and human law is the variable enactment of the good. Uh, or to be more accurate, since there are several human goods, human law is the variable enactment of varying goods. So religion aims at perfection, it counsels perfection. Governments kind of muddle through amidst competing interests. So from the initial presentation, you might conclude that these laws never come into conflict. Uh, but Montesquieu also indicates that the great principle of separation between divine and human law is itself subject to other less well-known principles which must be sought. <coughs> and indeed, that impression of easily separated spheres is soon belied by the thorny topics that he takes up. Uh, and almost all of these topics relate to what we would now call family values. Uh, he talks about issues like marriage, divorce, adultery, abortion, incest, uh, and the inheritance of property. They're issues that remain very contentious uh, in our own politics. Uh, which order of law should govern marriage? Uh, who decides whether marriage is for life, uh, or whether and how and on what grounds it's dissolvable? Uh, who decides whether there's such a thing as gay marriage? Uh, can you marry your first cousin? Can you marry multiple people? Uh, do children have a right to inherit uh, from their parents? Uh, on what principles are you going to make all of those decisions? So Montesquieu's laid out these different perspectives and aims of divine and human law. He then abruptly introduces natural law in chapter 3. Natural law seems to be some new category, some intermediate category, neither divine nor human. It has the fixed character of divine law, but it is not about the best or highest possibilities of humanity. Uh, and in fact, Montesquieu discusses natural law entirely in terms of natural defense. In other words, the right of self-preservation. Self this is not an, uh, uh, Thomas's, Thomas Aquinas's version of natural law. So it seems that Montesquieu is in agreement with the modern reduction of natural law to natural right. Uh, and he's critical of civil laws that interfere with or punish self-defense. Then Montesquieu does something really interesting. Uh, he takes this argument in, I think, in a kind of unprecedented direction. Uh, and he asserts that the defense of bodily integrity includes the defense not just of one's life, but of sexual modesty and even one's reputation for sexual modesty. So he talks about some very specific laws that the French had. Uh, he rejects a law that required women to confess whether they'd had sex before marriage or not. Uh, rejects a law that required unmarried women to register their pregnancies. The intent of the law was to protect the souls of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the newborn, in other words, to prevent abortion and infanticide. Uh, so Montesquieu says this is wrong because if you require a young girl to admit publicly her unchaste behavior, that violates her modesty. So Montesquieu seems to be concerned both with the preservation of the child, uh, but also with uh, the preservation of the woman's privacy. Uh, and I think he's here pretty prescient about the possibility for conflicts of rights, right? the difficulty of, of navigating these issues. Uh, he then extends natural defense further in the next chapter. Um, he argues that the right against self-incrimination in court proceedings should apply to family members so that a wife shouldn't be required to testify against her husband. So natural law protects the integrity of the family just as it protects bodily and sexual integrity. Um, yeah, I'll maybe sit there's this strange odd discussion there about Racine's play uh, Phaedra uh, sort of begins this discussion of, uh, of, of incest. I'll maybe skip over the, uh, over the details of that. Uh, but basically in both of these cases uh, with abortion and incest, uh, he's highlighting cases in which natural modesty might create a conflict of rights or might give rise to an exception to the principles of natural law. So 
and, and then and then it seems to me Montesquieu concludes this section, which is chapters three through seven, by limiting the range of natural law. So he says, natural law orders fathers to feed their children. It does not oblige them to make them their heirs. So he here makes inheritance a matter for political and civil law rather than natural right. Um, so if I can pull back a little bit from this, what, what I think he's doing with the presentation of natural law, he's accomplishing two different goals. He specifies limits of natural law vis-a-vis -vis civil law which thereby enlarge the reach of humanly crafted, socially conscious law. So in the matchup between natural law and civil law, he seems to give more to civil law. But at the same time, he grants priority to natural law vis-a-vis -vis religious law. And thereby he scales back the reach of religion into both public and private life. So he's doing kind of different, two, two different things there. Uh, not surprisingly, the topic that keeps coming up again and again in these chapters is marriage. Uh, there's no institution in which private concerns, social concerns, political concerns, religious concerns so intermingle, overlap, and conflict. Uh, Montesquieu introduces the topic of marriage in chapter three with a brief discussion of divorce. This should strike you as funny. Uh, to raise the topic of marriage through a discussion of divorce uh, is a tellingly pessimistic gambit. It's like proposing marriage to your beloved prenup in hand. Uh, without absolutely saying so, he hints that divorce is a natural right belonging to the individual who should consult her interest in determining whether the discomforts of the marriage are no longer bearable. At this point, Montesquieu doesn't say anything about what this might mean for Christianity and its sacramental understanding of marriage. But he returns to the topic uh, just a, a few chapters later. Uh, and in chapter 8, uh, he does point out that before Christianity introduced notions of equality into marriage, the law always treated female infidelity much more harshly than male infidelity. So the Christian notion of spiritual equality uh, uh, in, in, you know, in, in marriage, uh, Montesquieu says it's an instance of purely spiritual ideas overriding biological realities uh, and, and, and therefore social realities, social realities that are rooted in biological realities. So Montesquieu stresses the fact that the bastard children of the wife belong necessarily to the husband and are the hus husband's burden, whereas the bastard children of the husband belong neither to the wife nor are her burden. In essence, he argues that the pre-Christian sexual double standard made good social sense. So he defends that, that double standard. He says it was with reason. Uh, in chapter 9, uh, he reiterates the distinction between religion's quest for individual goodness and the civil law's quest for the general good of society. Uh, and he traces the effect of that distinction on views of the purpose of marriage. So he argues that Christianity is really responsible for a seismic shift. Pre-Christian, non-Christian peoples, among them, the laws regulating marriage reflect political concerns, two kinds of political concerns. Concerns for female mores, for the fidelity of women, uh, and concerns for population growth. Christianity replaces these two concerns with a spiritual concern for the sanctity and indissolubility of marriage. And Montesquieu illustrates the difference uh, with his uh, discussion of the fate of war widows, uh, both before and after Christianity. So in ancient times, if the husband is missing in action, presumed dead, maybe just deserted his wife, he's AWOL from the marriage, a woman could remarry with ease. What happened under Justinian, Christian emperor, is that a woman had to procure proof of her husband's death before she could be permitted to, to remarry. Proof was usually unattainable, uh, which meant that women were consigned to a kind of conjugal limbo. And Montesquieu thinks that has bad effects on population, right, because the woman can't, uh, can't remarry and have more children. And it has bad effect on female mores, uh, because the more people who are uh, unmarried, uh, he says, the, the more robbers you have. The more robbers you have, the more robberies you get. Uh, in, uh, in chapter 13, 
which is the central chapter of Book 26. It's entitled, In Which Case the Laws of Religion Must Be Followed with Regard to Marriages, and In Which Case the Civil Laws Must Be Followed. Montesquieu here tries to articulate a division of authority between church and state with respect to marriage. Initially, he seems to say, oh, civil law just can add some requirements to the religious requirements. You know, you could ask for a proof of age or a blood test or something like that. Uh, but the impression of happy harmony between religious and civil law is decisively undercut by Montesquieu's footnote. Montesquieu is one of the first philosophers to use footnotes. Uh, and he uses them in a very uh, intentional way. You have to actually look up the footnotes that he sends, to, sends you to. Uh, so the footnote that he refers the reader back to is Book 23, Chapter 21. It is one of the longest, one of the most forthrightly anti-Christian chapters in the spirit of the laws. Uh, in that chapter, Montesquieu details the demise of the old laws of Rome, pre-Christian laws of Rome, which sought to induce the citizens to marry. He calls this the finest part of the Roman civil laws. And it says it was destroyed by the advent of Christianity, uh, or more precisely, the establishment of Christianity under Constantine. So according to Montesquieu, Christianity damaged marriage by positing a perfectionist ideal of celibacy. Right? Celibacy is to be, to be preferred to marriage. It's higher. And then at the same time, allowing marriage, but allowing it only as a perpetual union. So he thinks there's both there's simultaneously a denigration of marriage because celibacy is preferred, and you are then loading marriage with these unsustainable demands. Uh, and he argues that the damage to the institution of marriage damaged prosperity, it damaged population growth, and it damaged political development. It plunged Europe into long centuries of disarray. Uh, it's a pretty strong claim. Uh, Throughout his writings, not only in the Spirit of the Laws, but also in the Persian Letters, Montesquieu endorsed reforms that would weaken the religious definition of marriage and restore civil governance over the institution. Accordingly, he favors Protestantism over Catholicism, and he argues repeatedly for the permissibility of divorce on grounds of incompatibility. In other words, not, not just violations, not, not you know, abuse or, uh, or infidelity, but sim on, simply on grounds of infidelity. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, grounds of incompatibility. Now, I think it's really remarkable that after this central chapter of Book 26, there is no further mention of religious law anywhere in Book 26. All of the remaining disputes and prioritizing are between natural law, civil law, political law, domestic law, the law of nations. So re by halfway through the book, Religious law has been effectively demoted or sidelined. Uh, and the scope of natural law has also been narrowed. Right? Narrowed from its capacious Christian version to a more restricted, uh, preservation-minded modern version with the addition of this sexual familial emphasis uh, that Montesquieu gives to it. Uh, Maybe, I, I don't know if I want to go, th well, I, I argue that you can see the effect of this retrenchment uh, in the, his handling of the incest taboo, uh, which he takes up in chapter 14. Uh, I don't want to go through all the details of that, but I think what he's doing there, uh, he's sort of uncovering the origin of the incest taboo. Uh, it's not purely natural, but it's a kind of natural convention. Uh, Montesquieu also reveals that this incest taboo can take different forms among different peoples. Uh, it will fluct the incest taboo will fluctuate with the definition and extension of the household, right, which can assume different forms in different places among different peoples. Uh, now he says, uh, don't mistake me, don't think that I am trying to lessen the horror of incest by you know, by even talking about it, right? Even bringing up the issue and trying to uh, sort of examine the reasons for it uh, in a way undermines the taboo against it. Uh, but I think his aim is not to undermine sexual mores. It's rather to set forth a certain principle, and that principle is the principle of household integrity. And once you understand the principle of household integrity, then the civil law can come to the assistance of that household integrity by reasoning about particular circumstances. 
So just to mention, you know, the way in which you might start to apply this in our own case, uh, think about our brave new world of assisted reproductive technologies, right? anonymous sperm donation, uh, surrogacy, perhaps human cloning, uh, gay families. Uh, I mean, that, that one is maybe the most interesting. In order to create a gay family, you have to go outside of the gay household right, to sperm donation or surrogacy. Uh, in other words, gay families exist only by rejecting that idea of household integrity. So it might be a, a way of way of sort of examining uh, the current situation through a, through a Montesquieu lens. All right. Uh, uh, next three chapters, 15 through 17, he kind of breaks away a bit from the focus on the family or he, he shifts from sort of the sexual aspect of the family uh, to, to property. Uh, and here again, he's sort of shifting the boundaries between different kinds of law. So his official topic is the relationship between political and civil law. Uh, both political and civil law uh, are described as premised upon a flight from nature. Uh, the constriction of the natural law that occurred in the previous chapters, in other words, the reduction of natural law to natural right, eventuates in this depreciation of nature. It was the passage, uh, Vicki, that you cited that has the typo in it. Uh, men abandon their natural independence to gain liberty. Right? They give up the natural independence they had in the state of nature in order to gain a secure liberty. That's the aim of political law, the security of liberty. They renounce the natural community of goods that existed in the state of nature in order to acquire property. Property or the security of property is the aim of the civil law. It initially seems that Montesquieu is separating the realm of law devoted to the public good, political law, from that devoted to the particular good of individuals, the civil law. But what he in fact does, I think, is to subordinate the public interest to the private. So he sets forth a maxim. He says, it is never in the public good for an individual to be deprived of his goods by a political law or regulation. In other words, he's rebuking um, exploitative government, uh, governmental depredations. Montesquieu doesn't absolutely deny that there's a right of eminent domain, but he insists on compensation, and in general, he warns against the abuse of the governmental taking power. So he shifts priority to the good of the individual, and he gives this sort of lovely nurturing metaphor for the operation of the civil law. He says that the civil law looks upon a citizen with a mother's eyes, which means that it considers each individual as the whole city. Uh, as you kind of wing your way through this massive book, uh, you can't lose sight of prior definitions. Just six chapters back in Book 26, while Montesquieu was, ex was engaged in excluding the sublime, uh, the demotion of, uh, of religion, uh, there he said that religion was associated with the individual, remember, and his perfection. Civil law there was linked to the collective and its mores. Now, however, once the blackballing of religious concerns has been completed, Montesquieu can reintroduce the individual, but it's now a new individual. And it's no longer the Christian individual who aims at goodness, it's a Montesquieuan individual who aims at acquiring goods, tangible property. In the earlier matchup between religious and civil law, Montesquieu gave the victory to public spirited civil law. Now, that the matchup is between political and civil law, he gives the victory to a reconfigured, more individualistic civil law. So the contours of the world are sort of changing before your eyes. Uh, and you have to pay attention to these, all these shifting definitions in order to see it. I mean, it is like a metamorphosis. <laughs> uh, and I think there's a very striking word choice uh, that captures this revolution. Uh, Montesquieu calls the civil law the palladium of property. The palladium was a cult statue of Pallas Athena, 
Right. That statue protected Troy. It later protected Rome. Uh, indeed, the Greeks could not defeat Troy until Odysseus and Diomedes had stolen that sacred statue. Centuries later, the first Christian emperor, Constantine the Great, was said to have removed the statue from Rome to Constantinople and placed it within the column of Constantine. So Montesquieu engages in his own form of theft or reappropriation. He takes this word palladium, which is emblematic of the empire of the city, and he attaches it to the small holdings of ordinary folks. He sanctifies the individual, his property, and the form of law that's dedicated to its, its safekeeping. Uh, so that's what he does for the individual, and he does something very different for the rulers. And in chapters 16 and 17, he places the matter of monarchic succession and ostracism under political law. And that has the effect of rendering rulers insecure, because the preservation of the state could justify changes in the right of succession, could justify forced abdications from the throne, uh, it could justify the exiling of the king. So that's a, that's a kind of a Lockean, uh, very Lockean moment uh, in, this, in this book. Um, he then goes back to sexual matters. He does this thing where he sort of goes back and forth between the sexual matters and the family and these political matters of, of rulers. Uh, there's a couple of very complicated little chapters. They're all about laws regarding adultery. Uh, I think what he's really up to there, he wants to make adultery a domestic rather than a civil matter. In other words, it won't even come under the purview of the law any longer. It'll be, <laughs> it will be between the parties concerned and that's it. Uh, so his overall aim is to render law less inquisitorial uh, and not incidentally more compatible with the freedom of women. Uh, he then goes back to the prince. We're nearing the end. Been very patient. Uh, chapters 20 to 23, he goes back to the prince. Uh, he examines the right of nations. Uh, he begins from a Lockean observation that princes are in a state of nature vis-a-vis -vis other princes. Hence, they are governed by force, unlike the people who are free because we live under civil laws. Even the realm of force, though, Montesquieu wants to show, has elements of order. And so he does things like explain the rationale for treaty obligations, the rationale for diplomatic immunity. Uh, he, he also talks about guidelines for uh, international tribunals, uh, you know, uh, Court at the Hague or the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, his reflections there would have relevance to those kinds of things. Uh, the limitations upon princely power reach a peak in chapter 23 where he states a final principle. The well-being of the people is the supreme law. This is the only use of all capitals. That line is in all capitals. It's the only use of all capitals within any of the 605 chapters of the spirit of the laws. Uh, and the application that he makes of the principle brings him back to that topic of monarchic succession. Uh, once again, he argues for the legitimacy of altering the order of succession. The nation itself has the right to require renunciation of the throne. Uh, all right, so the final summary. Uh, according to Montesquieu's original plan for the spirit of the laws, this is according to Paul Ray, uh, book 26 would have been the penultimate book to be followed by what is now Book 29. The title of Book 29 is On the Way to Compose the Laws. It's very explicit uh, advice to legislators. That plan to go from 26 to 29 and end the book there was abandoned very late in the publication process uh, to add all of those books that deal with the evolution of the French monarchy. But the original plan would have made more evident, I think, the relationship between principle and prudence in Montesquieu, because the most principled book, Book 26, would then have been very visibly yoked together with the most prudential book, uh, the book that contains Montesquieu's fervent endorsement of moderation. I say it, and it seems to me that I have written this work only to prove it. The spirit of moderation should be that of the legislator. So the juxtaposition of books 26 and 29 is sort of like the word prudence coming right after the statement of self-evident truths 
right, in that second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. You state the universal principles, uh, and then you say, you know, prudence will dictate uh, in, in which situations you can actually act successfully on these principles. So the principles and maxims that Montesquieu formulates in Book 26 reorder the orders of law and they resituate the responsibility for law firmly in the hands of secular legislators. To give a summary of what I think he's done, divine and ecclesiastical law are severely restricted. Natural law is likewise restricted to what follows from the right of self-preservation. The right of nations is corrected to restrain rulers. Political law is held answerable to a universal standard, the well-being of the people, in other words, the security of liberty. Finally, more matters are placed under the auspices of the civil law, which is responsible for the security of property, or even left entirely to private determinations. Civil law is the most flexible of the orders, and it is the most attentive to circumstances. To avoid the kinds of, uh, and here I'm going to give you a number of adjectives that Montesquieu sprinkles through his discussion of various laws in various places. He says to avoid the kinds of outrageous, iniquitous, unbearable, senseless, and terrible civil laws of the past, Montesquieu reconceives the purpose of civil law. In future, it will be the work of prudent Montesquieu statesmanship to adjust the demands of the law to the good and goods of the individual. Now, uh, Rory Shatner is going to offer comments. He's assured us they will honor the principle of moderation in the lab. Whoa, that's not that. good. Um, and so, that's not good. Uh, Rory, uh, okay. Sorry about that. So, uh, thank you very much for your paper. Uh, it, it pres if Montesquieu presents a challenge to the reader, uh, a scholarly exegesis of Montesquieu presents a challenge to the respondent, since you. My first try, I simply sort of reproduced a commentary on your commentary. Uh, and so trying to boil it down, I guess someone in the hallway before the talk, who had not read the paper, asked me what it was about. And I said, well, it starts with the Federalists, <laughs> but I, in my opinion, it's mostly about sex. And I, would, um, I guess to connect it to the scope of the book 26, uh, I guess it wouldn't be surprising if sexual mores would be of fundamental importance for Montesquieu if he's describing the new, a new modern theory of liberty based somehow on, uh, on, on uh, England, uh, in, in which liberty is going to be a passion. It would seem the most, one of the main competitors to the passion for liberty or one of the com complicated aspects would have to be the, the passion uh, related to the sexual passions. And so, uh, it, it, it sort of sort of begs the question. Um, and for, I guess for me the most interesting part of the paper and also in a certain sense the part that I would like to, to hear a bit more of or about is regarding, um, again, this issue of sexual modesty. Uh, you talk about the natural law and Montesquieu seeming to follow the pattern of early modern thinkers in reducing natural law to natural rights, making its scope therefore more narrow than Christian natural law. And then you note, I guess, what you say is uh, un the uncommon or un unparalleled uh, move he makes to extend uh, natural right or self-preservation to the preservation of one's modesty. And I, it struck me as not merely uh, an, an, an interesting extension of the idea of self-preservation, but in fact, kind of a paradoxical one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought of two formulations. If you look at Hobbes' discussion of, the, of, of natural right as self-preservation, he seems to make a great deal of emphasis, especially in De Kiwi, on the idea that if there's no injustice in self acts of self-preservation, there's no shame in it, there's no sin in it. And so, and in a sense, to say that in defending your self-preservation would include just defending your modesty, your, your sense of shame, you'd have to shamelessly defend your, your sense of shame. And I, I, it just seems very, uh, in a way, sort of strange uh, to my mind. And it's hard to quite understand how that works out. And I was thinking a little bit about some, I don't know if it was a, sort of a Montesquieuian move or a Freudian uh, slip on page bottom of page 10, where you're talking about this issue of uh, 
these uh, civil laws requiring women to admit if they're pregnant uh, outside of wedlock, if they're unmarried, or admit that they've had sexual intercourse before they get married. And the issues are to do with procreation and concern for the child's life, uh, worries about infanticide and abortion. And so you say Montesquieu is concerned to provide for, quote, the, self -pr the preservation of the child, but he does not want to violate the woman's, to violate the woman's privacy. Now, I don't know. I didn't look at the, at the spirit of the laws to, uh, at that specific passage, but I'm willing to bet Montesquieu doesn't use the, use the word privacy. And I, I guess um, my question would be, though, if in a way what we mean by privacy is exactly where he's headed, where this kind of theory is headed. And to me, that sort of is... Yeah what's puzzling or interesting about extending self-preservation to the realm of modesty. And to try and explain that, I would simply say it is as follows, that on the one hand, when contemporary, say, Supreme Court decisions have spoken about uh, a woman's or, 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 different, or men and women's right to privacy in the sexual sphere, sometimes that's been in line with certain things that, again, would be in accordance with this kind of move away from earlier, more traditional laws regarding mm -hmm. pregnancy, regarding premarital intercourse. Um, and that, of course, then, but it, or it could, and so it could potentially uphold modesty, laws against rape, against sexual assault. On the other hand, the same moral language of privacy can be used to defend the lawfulness of any consensual act done in private. So the same moral language can be used to, for example, uh, overturn as unconstitutional law against sodomy. So it seems that the private sphere of the individual um, can, on the one hand, be something which could protect modesty. On the other hand, it could be something which could, in a way, um, sort of deracinate the whole idea of modesty. And you see this, I think, in the, um, in the issue, not to, I don't, I'm sort of hesitant to raise a, such a hot button issue, but on the issue of uh, rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment, uh, on campus and, and the workplace, especially on campus, uh, where there's, it's, it's hard sometimes to know uh, those who express concern sometimes fall back into using language which seems to speak to the violation of modesty of the victims of these acts. And of course their modesty is violated. Um, on the other hand, there's sometimes a worry to even to not want to use any of the language of modesty, but in, instead to, to make it a matter of consent, physical force, or uh, again, I don't know, psychological well-being in the case of, say, sexual harassment, uh, which is not necessarily physical. And so I, I just sort of wonder, again, whether what really happens when you extend natural self-preservation to the preservation of modesty isn't something like this, that really modesty ceases to be what it used to be, or as it used to be both in pagan and, say, Christian communities in which one's modesty, just like one's honor for an aristocrat, could be could be lost. It doesn't seem that your right to self-preservation can ever be lost. So, in some sense, your modesty therefore can never fully be lost. And and if you look at the, if you could think of the classic defense of laws making women admit they were pregnant outside of marriage or admit uh, premarital sex, I don't know, on the night of their wedding or whenever they had to do it, the defense could be, well, of course we believe in modesty, but this woman or a, a man in the community has violated that modesty, right. and so these acts are what takes place after the loss of modesty there. So they're no longer concerned. With, it's a matter of, of honor or modesty dispersed. And so, you know, I, I, so I kind of open that up because I wonder, uh, I, I just have this guess that in a way you, you want to read Montesquieu as uh, potentially offering a countervailing voice against the forces of uh, who avail themselves of the right to privacy jurisprudence, let us just say. And I wonder if, in a way, he sows rather, in a sense, sows the seeds for all of this concern for the, uh, for the integrity of the family. He seems to also, above all, elevate the integrity of the individual and not the, not the family. But I'll leave it there, and uh, thank you again for the paper. Yeah, uh, really... Uh, fascinating comments, uh, and I think you've picked up a, uh, a very interesting issue that he may be using sexual modesty and redefining sexual modesty, that sexual modesty really becomes more about reputation or kind of uh, vanity. Uh, so, I mean, if I have you right, you're suggesting that what Montesquieu has done is really opened up a kind of libertine... No, it, he's, he's uh, done to modesty what Christianity did to marriage. He's elevated it or enlarged it in one sense, and he's diminished it in another. So he imitates Christianity, I guess. That's sort of 
Yeah, but that's they, my they, hypothesis. But they, this but, that, but that the end result of that uh, is really. I don't know. I don't know if he created the the, the modern world, but I, the end result might. I mean, be I, I, I I do think that <laughs> that you resources could, are more limited on the on the subject of modern. That you could make the case that what he's really doing, he's using this older language, but he is opening up new possibilities for kind of affectional freedom and sexual freedom and a kind of and a kind of libertinage. Maybe, or at least he would. He makes you, you have to, as we do today, we have to argue, even if you argue against libertinage, you can't, you can't use the word libertinage, especially if you want to be understood. <laughs> you, have to, you have to say something else. So maybe, uh, Let me open up yeah. questions yeah. if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay, so, apparently, so, we can, as a thing, divide the whole world of you. Two halves. In the first half, Manuskin talks about the topology regime, including especially the classical republics. But in the second half, Manuskin begins to move to his modern notions, which includes such uh, things as the, uh, the idea that the, the, the protection of private property is the end of civil laws, is the only end, perhaps, of civil laws. But the question is, in his discussion on the classical republics, Montesquieu refers to the practice confiscation, the practice of division yeah. of lands, and all these unmodern sure. notions. So how should we examine these descriptions of Montesquieu after we have gone over his modern doctrine? His modern doctrine? Yeah, it's a, an important question, what is Montesquieu's stance on the ancient republic? Some people read him as uh, endorsing that republic. Uh, some of the American founders read him in that way, the anti-federalists, that you know, Montesquieu was the great defender of, uh, of republics, uh, small, small republics. Uh, I, as I read it, he is a severe critic of the ancient republic. And the reason he's such a severe critic of it is because the ancients had to resort to precisely those kinds of things. They were hostile to commerce. They were hostile to women. Uh, they uh, they uh, elevated homosexuality. Uh, all of those things were part of uh, the kind of suppression of human nature that the ancient republics committed. So I, I think he regards the ancient republic as inhuman in a certain way, especially if Sparta is taken as kind of the model of the, of the ancient republic. What do you think are the positive things that Montesquieu has still retained? What From, what, ab about the ancient about republics? Is, what, which is, or despite his criticism, what positive things? Yeah, I, I really don't think he takes, he takes anything from, from the ancient republics. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he shows that there is a, a kind of contradiction between the nature and the principle of the of the ancient republic. Uh, its nature is to be uh, governed by the people. So sovereignty of the people is the nature of those regimes. Uh, but the principle of those regimes, the passion that that sustains them, is that rigorous denial of self, self renunciation. And Montesquieu doesn't think that there's any last, you can't keep those two things together. At one point he says, you know, if you're really serious about virtue, what do you end up with? Uh, you end up with Plato's Republic. Right? That's not sovereignty of the people. Uh, and if you really take the, uh, take the route of uh, sovereignty of the people, uh, pretty quickly that, uh, that rigorous virtue uh, is going to go by the wayside. So, uh, I mean, he rejects it. Partly because it's it's simply unsustainable, uh, but I think he also rejects it maybe more fundamentally because there's something inhuman about it. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and, and maybe I just say one one more thing. I mean, you know, in a way, you might say, well, why does he have to engage in all of that discussion? Isn't it enough to know that the that the uh, ancient republic is no longer possible, right? Um, we live in a different time. We're not going to go back to those tiny little city states. Uh, why don't we just allow history to dispense with uh, with the ancient republic? But I think that Montesquieu thinks that he has to uh, meet the ancient republic on a different ground. It's not enough to trust a history because uh, even if uh, even if the ancient republic is no longer possible for us, it still might stand as a kind of ideal, uh, and he wants to destroy its viability as an ideal. Whether he's actually fair to the ancient republic or 
<laughs> be another question, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I thought the main principle of your talk, which you wanted to highlight, was Montesquieu's prioritization of religious, oh, sorry, of civil law over religious law, and you didn't spend very much time talking about the justification for this. You mentioned it in passing, I think, when you talked about the insinuating strategy that he has, mm -hmm. and you said that he doesn't confront what might be the key question directly. So I suppose the question would be if this really is his answer to the problem of religion, the insinuating strategy, make people interested in worldly goods and forget religion, do you regard that as a satisfactory answer and could someone like Montesquieu have really regarded that as a satisfactory answer? And the second part of the question is you wrote a very good book on the Persian letters and I wonder whether his answer to religion isn't there and so it isn't isn't in the Persian letters and so that's uh, where you, he does confront it directly in a, in a, and so in a way uh, yeah, it's a more somewhat, important work. Somewhat more directly yeah so you could say that maybe he doesn't think he has to repeat that and get in trouble yeah. all over again um, yeah um, yeah whether it's satisfactory um, I mean Rousseau didn't regard it as satisfactory and sort of took took Montesquieu on. Uh, lots of people who've lived in liberal orders have not regarded it as, it as satisfactory. Uh, but I guess that Montesquieu, like, like Locke and other early moderns, uh, believes that they have, believe, be, they believe that they understand something true about human nature uh, and, that, uh, and that this is the regime that will deliver peace, prosperity, uh, an increase in happiness for or, for ordinary people. Okay. Uh, so you know, I mean, w one place to go would be to look at the at the preface. Uh, there he says, "I would consider myself the happiest of mortals if I could make it so that men were able to cure themselves of their prejudices." So Montesquieu doesn't say he can cure them, but he can help them to cure themselves. Here I call prejudices not what makes one unaware of certain things, but what makes one unaware of oneself. Uh, right after that, he goes on to say that man is a very flexible being and that we can adapt ourselves in society. Uh, we're equally capable of knowing his own nature when it is shown to him and of losing even the feeling of it when it is concealed from him. So that's really interesting. There's a kind of human nature, but there's also a flexibility. There's a flexibility such that you can end up with the Spartan mother, right? <laughs> that, that unnatural creature. Right? Uh, but he really seems to say that what, what happens there, there, there has been a kind of self-forgetting and all kinds of regimes that we see around the world encourage that self-forgetting. And Montesquieu wants to somehow bring us back to, to, not, to knowledge of ourselves. So is your view that the refutation is in the Persian letters and that he didn't feel the need to repeat it or that the refutation is just the historical project in the The, the refutation order. of? Religion. Revealed religion. Well, what, I mean, what do you mean by refutation of religion? That it's false. Or that it couldn't possibly be known to be true. I mean, or do you not think that he would even have to make that assumption? Yeah, he I mean, he's interested in the, in the civic effects of, of religious teachings. So it's not, I mean, he's not, I don't think he's intent on, on completely destroying Christianity. Uh, and in fact, in certain places, he says that Christianity has been responsible for some good things. He seems to connect the turn against slavery uh, with the Christian teaching of, of the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. Uh, so he, he sees certain good things in Christianity, but there's a theological, political problem, and he has, he has a way of solving it that he thinks will not provoke the religious into, uh, into uh, virulent uh, backlash or fanaticism. Mm -hmm. So in a way, he doesn't really take the question itself that seriously, he just you can, wants to you can, he, he proceeds by indirection. You can find a way around it. You can give people other enticements that will draw them away from ultimate questions.
work up, but say a Christian thinker would <laughs> concede that point that you can be drawn away from the, the yeah. question of religion. <laughs> <laughs> right. so that's a big problem. So for right. some reason, one just and they see. and they and they uh, they lit out after him uh, those who recognized what he was doing, uh, and he had to defend himself and uh, wrote extensive defenses of the of the spirit of the laws to the to the religious authorities. Thank you very much, and thank you for a very instructive and insightful paper. Um, your, the title of your paper is Montesquieu's Legislator, and I would just like to hear what you have to say about Montesquieu as legislator, um, and the way you, you drew out the, the sort of the schema of the, 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 the book, the last chapter, would be the chapter on legislators. Yeah. And the legislators he names yeah. are Plato, Aristotle, yeah, right, yeah. Machiavelli, uh, Moore and Harrington. Yeah. So let's assume that he's putting self, himself in that yeah, company. That yeah. He's self-reflective enough to put himself in that category, and also yeah, to say some pretty dismissive things about each one of yeah, them. Yeah. No, and, and he does, <laughs> and he says that they that he's extremely critical of all of them because they were led astray by their passions and their prejudices. Mm -hmm. And when you you say you're going to concentrate on principles, you draw that. He says, I, I, I drew my principles from the nature of things. Yeah. But if you put that, that statement back in the, the whole sentence in the preface, it is, I drew my principles not from my prejudices, right. but from the nature of things. So yeah. he seems to be suggesting that he's... He's better than all those guys. All those guys. And I'm wondering whether you think that that's actually what he's saying and whether it's justified. And it seems to go along with your claim that all the other regimes, the Romans, uh, the Jews... Yeah. The Eastern empires, they were all confused. So it seems to be a very provocative statement. Um, and yeah. to what extent is he really serious about that? And he's certainly not, mod you know, on the one hand, he, he praises moderation. But if you really put all these things together, he's anything but moderate on this claim. And I was just wondering what, what your reflections are. Yeah, that his own aspirations are, uh, are maybe not not so moderate, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I really do think he regards himself as the equal of or actually not Aristotle the equal. or the, the, the superior. The superior of yeah, I, I mean, he, he picks up that theme at the end of the, of the preface. He says, if this work meets with success, I shall owe much of it to the majesty of my subject. Still, I do not believe that I have totally lacked genius. <laughs> when I have seen what so many great men in France, England, and Germany have written before me, I've been filled with wonder, but I have not lost courage. And I, too, am a painter, have I said with Correggio. Uh, and the, and the, and the uh, epi epigram to the whole work is you know, a child born without a mother as if this was conceived from the forehead of, of Montesquieu with, you know. So there's a little That's room for humility. That, <laughs> that proved it so badly that he's done slightly better. It doesn't, so there's relative arrogance, but there might be absolute humility. That is, that others could even do better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Yes. Um, this one's easy. Um, on page 15, you note uh, Montesquieu's critique of Christian marriage. And, and um, a part of that critique has to do with a, a depopulation or, or yeah. lack of population. Right? Okay, well, um, it seems to me that, um, that Christian Europe, for example, uh, even given its, its, its enclaves of, of, of uh, what would you say, um, um, uh, celibacy or committed virginity, even given that, did pretty well at reproducing itself. Whereas, whereas um, uh, post-Christian Europe is in free fall. Um, is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so yeah. That's, uh, the, uh, the footnote fifty-five. That's in the same section. And you said, you know, his footnotes are important. Uh -huh. But your footnote <laughs> then goes on to say. Yeah, the footnotes are the best part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what might Montesquieu say about marriage in our contemporary world? Increasingly, it seems that heterosexual adults are not marrying, choosing instead to either remain single or live together without benefit of marriage. Even when they do marry, growing numbers of couples are choosing to remain childless. At the same time, homosexual adults are agitating for and increasingly gaining the right to marry, finding ways to produce or acquire children. What civil laws would Montesquieu endorse now? And how would he adjudicate the disputes between religious and civil authorities? 
that's really interesting. I mean, uh, especially given that Europe, at least, and I don't know, so much of the modern world is stopping reproduction. What would he? What would he say to that? He cared about that. Period. Yeah, he did. And he he did care Romans about Romans for encouraging. Yeah, he really does regard population as a kind of litmus test. Uh, places that are flourishing grow. Yeah. Uh, places that are in decline, you know, yeah. Detroit, uh, <laughs> they shrink, they depopulate. So he really took population as a yeah as a kind of uh, test yeah. for the success of a political order. Uh, I mean, maybe something fundamentally changes in the modern world with, uh, you know, with birth control and and all of that. But um, I mean, I, in a way, I, I still think he's he's right. Uh, so the the declining birth rates in Europe, especially, but the United States too, are a kind of indication of uh, uh, governmental. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's dangerous. It's bad. <laughs> so he would, yeah. Yeah, and I think he would regard it as bad. He says uh, the way to reverse it, I mean, he talks about French laws that um, tried to encourage population by giving extra money to those who had great numbers of children. And he said the point, though, is not to reward prodigies. So, you, you know, it's not, <laughs> not to just, you know, encourage people to have 10 children, but, you know, instead to have laws that, uh, that make it possible. I mean, there shouldn't be a marriage penalty. A t a t you know, things like that. A, t a tax penalty for those who marry. That's not a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, interesting footnote. Thank you. Yes. On, on um, same-sex marriage in particular, um, would Montesquieu have any reservations on the recent change in our laws on this question? It seems to me you can make a case that, and people do make the case, it seems to me, that you know, Montesquieu attacks the sacramental, Christian sacramental view of marriage, he is in favor of divorce laws. He's in favor of civil law over religious law. Civil law conceived as the preservation of private rights. And people now make the argument that the latest sort of progress on that front is the extension of same-sex marriage rights. And yeah. does, would Moscow have any reservations about that? Yeah, I mean, you, you can't know for sure what someone would mm -hmm. say 350 years later. Right. Uh, but he does in some way put in train uh, those things that will eventuate in our current situation. So, uh, you know, he, he's in favor of the shift away from arranged marriages towards marriages based on <coughs> consent and choice. So once you enshrine that principle of choice or consent, does that eventually lead to uh, the advent of, uh, of gay marriage? If it's just, you know... If, if, if marriage is just about love, uh, then there's no reason, I guess, to be opposed to gay marriage. Uh, but if marriage is fundamentally about population and children, uh, then it seems to me there are probably good grounds to have concerns about gay marriage. So Mont Montesquieu is interesting because he both seems to enshrine choice and affectional freedom and try to, he tries to open the gates wider to affectional freedom. Uh, but he does have that social and political concern for population. Uh, you know, Locke is maybe a little bit more consistent on divorce because what Locke says is, you know, it's a contract for the purpose of raising children. Uh, therefore, the, the contract has to continue through that child rearing phase. So Locke seems to allow for the permissibility of divorce, but only after the children are grown. Uh, Montesquieu doesn't, doesn't set that limitation, and when he says just on grounds of incompatibility, uh, there seems to be very little concern there for children. David Hume called him out on that uh, and said, you know, what about kids? <laughs> uh, don't these laws have to, uh, have, to have a view, a view to that? Yeah, it seems like the, the, the question involves not just the number of kids, but also the raising of children. Many people opposed to same-sex marriage think that all kids deserve a mom and a dad, as opposed to Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm, I sort of put that thing in there about, about household integrity. Right. So, you know, I mean, in, in a way it's really a misnomer. There is no such thing as a gay family because children 
can only be created through the union of, of egg and sperm. So uh, a gay couple has to go outside of the household, of their household, in order to produce or acquire children. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that what drives gay couples to, I mean, they want biologically related children. They want, each wants a child who is biologically related to themselves. So they recognize the overwhelming force of that desire for biological connection, and yet in the very act of bringing that child into being, they're in fact denying that child its own <laughs> biological connection to, to the two parents. Uh, so I, I think there will be eventually, and this is starting to happen already, children who, you know, are raised by two women who, of course, love both of their moms. Uh, I think they can be raised successfully, but, uh, you know, there is that hunger for, for the father or hunger for knowledge of your biological origins. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there will be a kind of, uh, there are gay kids of gay couples who are already beginning to speak out about that, uh, feeling that they have been, they were deliberately deprived of something. So I'm actually in favor of gay adoption, but not in favor of the uh, deliberate creation of gay children through sperm donation or surrogacy. So in the case of gay adoption, you have, yeah, children who were, you know, created by heterosexuals who screwed up so badly that those kids are in need of rescue. Uh, so it seems to me that's kind of the proper thing for gay couples to do is rescue those those children. And everybody there recognizes that the loss of connection to the biological parents is a kind of sadness or misfortune. Well, I mean, there's a, uh, there's a certain argument that uh, what you might find in the Old Testament that polygamy, whatever it does, falls and, and it has very many that Montesquieu can point out does um, produce lots of kids. Yeah. Uh, but but Montesquieu <laughs> says not. it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Because it produces lots of kids for certain families and not for the whole society. We, yeah, uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, he says that, yeah, but in the same way that Christian marriage leads to depopulation, he thinks polygamy leads to depopulation. It leads to depopulation partly because you've got all those eunuchs. Right. right, so people who are not part of the breeding pool. Uh, but also, he says, because of the nature of male sexuality, uh, when surrounded with such uh, wealth, uh, he seems to say there is a kind of boredom that sets in, and uh, they don't actually engage in the, uh, in the activity as often as you might, might, as you might think. Uh, well, he like also seems to connect that, to connect polygamy, actually, with a turn towards uh, homosexuality uh, and a turn uh, especially towards uh, young boys. So in the case of monogamy, is infertility presumed, I assume, another reason for divorce in his scheme? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, the Romans, uh, infertility was uh, grounds for divorce, and in fact, sometimes divorce was required by state authorities. Uh, in cases of infertility. Uh, it seems to me that Montesquieu doesn't go that far in saying that the only purpose of marriage is, is procreation, and so a loving connection, which is infertile, you know, the, the, the state should not interfere in that. Um, I like, liked your observation that uh, the, the, the meaning of principle initially is sort of motive or spring, and then mm -hmm. later it's more like law. Um, can you say something, um, and, and maybe I didn't pick up on it, about how that shift in the meaning of principle fits in what he's generally trying to do? Yeah, I, I guess maybe that uh, these regimes which concentrate into one passion, uh, that he finds fault with all of those regimes, with monarchies based on honor, republics based on virtue, and despotisms based on fear. And so uh, he no long, he does, he, in looking for some other kind of regime, he's not intent on finding a new passion. Uh, he's, so this is part of 
of the regime of liberty being in accord with our human nature. We have lots of passions. And so in the English regime, you get this, this release of, of all of the passions. They, they flourish. They proliferate. Uh, and so the political project becomes one of channeling those passions, countering passions with other passions. It leads to uh, you know, party government in, in England, uh, the partisanship of, of England, uh, and that's all, all well and good. That actually serves to keep this kind of dynamic equilibrium of the, uh, of the English constitutional order. Yeah, and, and this actually differs from, I mean, I think Paul Ray reads, reads it a little bit differently, and he thinks there is a, a passion that comes to the fore in the English case, but I, I don't see how you can make the case. But could I ask uh, just on this? Um, yeah. Does this mean that, um, that the political, the effectual truth of virtue is um, when it gets translated, when uh, the pursuit of virtue gets translated into politics, <coughs> is a focus on one virtue? instead of uh, um, the, ver the complete virtue. Y yeah, but, but here you might say that Montesquieu is, well, I don't know whether he's unfair to the ancient republic, but he's probably unfair to Aristotle, right? Uh, I mean, the way that Montesquieu defines virtue is not the way that Aristotle understands virtue. Aristotelian virtue is not a passion. All right, but uh, and maybe Aristotle made a mistake on this. <laughs> and that, uh, yeah, and that yeah, the trouble with this, this way of thinking, which concentrates on virtue, is, is this uh, uh, that, that virtue degenerates into in, in politics. Virtue degenerates into a passion, a one-sided passion, which um, makes you yeah. punish yourself instead of flourish or express yourself. Yeah, but it, I mean, the ancient philosophers are not the same thing as the ancient city. Uh, and his quarrel, at least in part one, is with the, is with the ancient city. Um, although he does say, I mean, there is a, there is a passage there where he, he faults Aristotle explicitly. Uh, for having paid too much attention to the character of rulers. Character of rulers. Really? Yeah. Rulers. You know, Incidental. in other words, you know, needing these virtues like courage and prudence and, and so on. <coughs> the, the distinction between the unity of virtues thesis and simply collapsing, you know, treating them as one sort of a principle or starring virtue, those are separable ideas. You were thinking about, as I understood it, you know, the one trumping virtue is, is that right? Well, uh, uh, that, no, it's, it's just that a, a regime is not going to, to uh, pursue or promote all the virtues, all these 11 virtues. Mm -hmm. the, the, the virtue of magnanimity, which sums up all other virtues, or even the virtue of justice, which sums up the social virtues. No, it's going to uh, narrow itself and, and, uh, and focus on on the one, so, and, and because that's such a tight focus, <laughs> it's, it, yeah, the, the virtue turns into a passion, which is a, a passion, especially for, in the case of republics, for, for punishing yourself. Right. The virtuous person is essentially a monk, but, but he calls these monkish <laughs> republics. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. And so, yeah, as, as sure, there is a difference between uh, the ancient philosophers and the ancient cities. So, you know, the, you know when, when we say Greeks uh, with, without specifying mm -hmm. which, uh, yeah, you, you can go far wrong. But but uh, ma maybe he means to say that, uh, uh, that the, 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 what ancient philosophers come down to is a defense of the ancient city. Yeah, yeah and that it, and that it, it it comes to center on courage, which requires yes. this kind of self control and self overcoming and sacrifice of self. Right. So you that say, despite the that, fact that uh, Plato and Aristotle spend so much time uh, attacking them, uh, focus on courage or, mm -hmm. or manliness. Yeah. So that that's 
the ancient cities are warrior cultures and Montesquieu mm -hmm. wants a, mm -hmm. a new kind of warrior, a commercial, commercial warrior. I was just going to follow up on that. I mean, I think he really does that explicitly. I mean, I, I think he um, purposely, well, I don't know whether he does it intentionally or not, but he completely disregards philosophy. And he explicitly associates the ancient philosophers, particularly Plato, with the ancient city in a way that I'm not sure Plato would, would agree with. But it's, he always links Minos, Lycurgus, and Plato, and in his Ponce, he says, you know, I'm not one of those who doesn't think that Plato's Republic is possible. It is definitely possible. Um, yeah. yeah, he yeah. says that the Republic is the perfected form of the of Lycurgus's laws. Right, absolutely. So, you know, again, I don't know, and, and it's on that basis that he is able to say, hey, I have something better because I'm only going to look at the political, and they were looking at the political too, but he doesn't look at the, the philosophical. At all. Oh. Uh, well, I, I'm kind of curious as to whether, so for him, the ancient city is, is Sparta then, not... Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's, it's, a rich, it's a richer analysis than that. So he, yes, it's Sparta if what you're focused on is virtue, uh, but what, if what you're focused on is the nature of the regime, the sovereignty of the people, that points more towards Athens. Uh, and so he does say that there are these kind of two, two lines of development of the ancient city. Uh, but in but in either but but neither one of them is sustainable. So that the better version that the n none of the none of the ancient republics which allowed for commerce uh, really embraced commerce in a in a full throated way in the way that England does. Because I mean they see they see themselves as very different, and the, certainly like Hercus's laws were completely different from the rest of the Greek laws, and it led to all kinds of strange behavior. Um, it, was, it was criticized, you see, in Plato's laws, that, that the, the other Greeks made fun of the, in, in many respects, the Spartan laws. So. Yeah, but, but what you see is, if you go the Athenian route, uh, it disintegrates because uh, because without that virtue, without that renunciation of self, you get the phenomenon of Alcibiades, and you know, uh, the, the the ancient city falls apart when people start to. But that's that's an interesting question to me in itself. Does he really think there's a solution to the political problem? That yeah. So you could have a city that doesn't. Maybe not apart. to the human problem, but yes, to the political problem. Yeah. That's that's very much in tension with the notion of moderation that you really think I mean, that you could solve solve the political. Well, I mean, he does say that even that even the yeah. English regime, you know, all human things will pass away. So he does say there will come a time when even the English regime will become corrupted. Uh, but this teaching of the separation of powers and constitutional mechanisms uh, extends life a long, <laughs> regime life a long way. One last question. No, just as a quick follow-up, like why then, um, would, why would the regimes only be corrupted um, by the institutions somehow um, failing, but not why not by this pleasure principle that in here said. I'm, I'm always struck yeah. by you know the the population thing in Montesquieu because it seems to me, did did he really think that having lots of children is for the people involved just a sh sheer pleasure and it's it's something that people seek out just because it's so wonderful to do? Why? I mean, his whole the, the notion of basically having a pleasant life is in tension with with population growth well, for many people at least. Kids aren't so, so bad. No, <laughs> but, but that's some people think about that, at least people think about that very differently. Let's put it that way. So Montesquieu must have seen that. There's just no way that I would accept that he that he didn't see that as a problem. That, you know, politics and and pursuing pleasures are Yeah, I I don't know that he uh, expected the elevation of the individual to lead to a I mean, I, I think he thinks it's a it's a it's a natural instinct. Uh, 
it has certain advantages, people to care for you in your old age, um, continuing the family line. Uh, I think he thinks there is enough there that people really? will have children so long as the institutions don't get in the way of doing that. And so it would be worth, it would be worth asking in our own case. Uh, I mean, yeah, people seem less interested in having children or in having a lot of children, but uh, you know, how, how does our incentives how are the incentives in our law affecting that and influencing that? In Germany, marriage is not punished. It's it's ta it's preferred tax wise. I mean, you, because you said you know mm -hmm. somehow marriage is punished. It's the opposite. That doesn't lead to more children. I mean, that's well, kids, not kids that simple. always become an obstacle to commerce. But maybe yeah. Marxist, you didn't foresee that for a number of reasons. <laughs> well, what if he saw the the not so much as a phenomenon of pleasure, but as a phenomenon of the desire for self-preservation and an extension of that. Yeah. Then he was Would that wrong be more? <laughs> okay, yeah, it turned out he was yeah. wrong, but that's not such a crazy idea. No. But in another way, you know, the, the prevalence of divorce, I mean, think of all of the families that you know who, as a result of serial monogamy, end up with quite a few kids. <laughs> right? I mean, that's sort of what much he was talking about. He's saying if you're if you're yoked together with someone you hate for your entire life, you're not going to do the thing you are supposed to do in marriage. Uh, whereas if you allow people to like Larry King, follow their what's druthers, what's uh, yeah. So I sort of wanted to push you a little harder on what I what I took to be Rory's main point in his response this and and you mentioned it yeah, I think I did not do justice to his uh, statement yeah, yeah you you made an admission at some point you said well perhaps perhaps he's put something in train that now we're reaping you know the, the results of and 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 I think this is what I took Rory to be getting at but uh, you closed your talk you talked about um, this attempt to to free people of their prejudices uh, so that they will come to know themselves, and uh, at the same time, this 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 nature that's underlying uh, what people are it seems to be almost Baconian in, in 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 the sense that the institutions are creating it. It's it's it, to some degree. Uh, so, I guess oh, my question would be something like this: If 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 having children or preserving familial integrity. Uh, if these things can be seen as prejudices rather than as, as present in nature, um, or if, if they are present in nature, then the prejudice is, is, is itself an expression of that nature. Um, well, you say exactly what Anna's pushing you on. Uh, the incentives are not there. In other words, it, it is not materially attractive enough to preserve familial integrity or to have children. So if we switch the institutions, we'll, we will create a nature in which the, the pleasure-seeking principle will maintain these things that previously were a result of prejudices that we've undermined through the system. And um, uh, so I guess my question is, is it the old adage, tongue-in-cheek, that under democracy, every, the solution to everything is always more democracy? Is, under liberalism or under Montesquieu, is the solution more Montesquieu? Uh, it, is it not possible that really Montesquieu is the enemy uh, and, and not the solution? <laughs> the, the enemy, you mean because uh, he's responsible for right. the current world and the current world is... Right. It took a long time it went for this to come project about. to work. Um, you know, it was... It had lots of benefits along the way. Now, now we're we're nearing the end of it. I mean, I'm I'm putting it to you in the starkest terms possible. Uh, yeah, it's possible, uh, and that would take us where back to back to Aristotle. There's something interesting in his discussion of, of uh, homosexuality. He, he, he I, I'm sure you're familiar with the with the passage. He, he doesn't like laws against homosexuality for the reason that it, 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 it creates conspiracies. He says it's a, it's a crime that, that in general can't be proven. It's a, it's a hidden crime. A hidden crime. Like magic and heresy. Right. Um, 
like magic and heresy. Yeah. And, Those and are the three <laughs> crimes that he discusses together. Right. Um, and yeah. And so I mean, I mean, this 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 the, this passage points to this question about nature and what is nature. Right. And he says. Right? And he says that. So. The, the prejudice. We need to maintain the prejudice against homosexuality without law. It needs to be policed. And that nature yeah. will reassert itself, uh, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah. So what he says, I mean, uh, he seems to be in favor of decriminalizing homosexuality. He doesn't like a kind of inquisition, right, right uh, to punish that. Uh, he believes that heterosexuality is the norm and that uh, by decriminalizing homosexuality, you're not going to increase homosexuality, uh, it's, it's, its occurrence, and whatever small amount of homosexuality there is will be able to be tolerated. And he says, so long as you don't have institutions that encourage it, and he names some of the institutions that encourage it, single-sex education it encourages homosexuality, speaks of the English especially. Uh, <coughs> So, you know, co-education and uh, things like that uh, would, would, so, so, I mean, that seems to me probably accurate. Mm -hmm. I suppose we continue the discussion as yes. these drinks. And, 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 uh, but first, uh, as, a, as someone who's writing a book on uh, principles for lawmakers, I'm very attracted to this less particulars picture that Montesquieu. So thank you for giving us that, and thank Rory for a terrific commentary. Yeah. Appreciate it.